Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Discussion with a Tree, talking to Mr. Robert Dold again. How are you, sir? Um, usually I say fantastic. Um, today I'll say enchanted. Oh, why, why do you say How that? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm enchanted, too. Well, that's fantastic. Well, enchanted is a feeling of great pleasure, delight. You know, it's kind of like magic. Yeah. Did you get I, any oh, benefit out of um, the last time we talked? The, the question I wanted to ask you first was, you know, what did you think about it? Like, do you, is it something you like doing? Do you like this format? It's a conversation. It's right. like having a conversation on the phone. It's like right now I'm talking to the world or I'm talking to myself as I'm talking to you. Right. So I do this regularly with myself. So it's really not taking me out of my normal state. If that makes sense? Yeah. So... When you, um, but when you do, you, you do have any reservations about having your views in public? Uh, what what is what is life? Let me ask you a different way, since you know, since it's a question that can be thrown around, since I can throw it back to you and you can throw it back to me. You, you you agreed to have a conversation with a tree. And I'm curious, and, you know, I don't want to leave you hanging, so to say, since that's what, we, that's what children do on trees. That's what I do. I saw a tree. I'd go hang around. And so I'm just hanging around, and I don't mind hanging around you. So the question really is, do you mind hanging around me for a little while? And that's a conversation with a tree. Why do you call it – I mean, you're the one who named this discussion – actually, discussion with a tree. So it's why did you – It's a conversation. It's a discussion. It, it, it's going to a, – a, a, tree, a, a tree is elemental to everything. Um, and the reality is that I am a tree, physically. And that's going to take some time to explain. Um, so I'm not like you. I'm not like the listener. And there's only a few. There's only a few trees I've ever seen walking around and most of us never get paid any attention to, even if we are found. People walk right by and lean on us and hang on us and hang on every single word of what we say. People really don't recognize just how deep the tree meaning is. Since people no longer play, so the tree is not a metaphor or a simile, and it's not a joke. Uh, on, on a tree, I never like to find anybody hang, hanging around as if to choke. And so the tree is um, a central part of the topic. Um, of science, history, everything that people do, and string theory. We are talking about something that most people that are scientists that get into that area and call it string theory. 
actually argue that it's a strain. And it's not. And it could be perceived or thought of as a strain. Just as I'm able to be thought of or perceived as a man or a boy or a boy man or a man boy or whatever you would call somebody that's 58 years old and you saw them outside like me hanging in the very best place that I'd rather be, which is hanging inside of a tree, hanging on a tree, sitting on a tree, and looking out, because, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the best view in the galaxy, especially at night. If you know exactly where to sit and you're looking out um, at the galaxy, the best place is in a tree, not on the ground. I mean, I, I do the ground stuff sometimes, and I do lay I, – I, I do like to – you know, trees do like to – just stand. Some trees uh, fall over. I fall over sometimes too. (laughs) So when you get into the science of things, a tree is an essential part of everything, especially when you're trying to devise. Since quantum theory is What's the definition for quantum theory? I mean, a string theory. Let me look it up. Um, I mean, it's it's the idea that point-like particles are replaced by one-dimensional objects called strings. Correct. Yeah, but but there's a specific thing about the, the the size of a tree mentioned in everything you read about. about uh, so, so so let me see the tree is really neat. So 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 when you talk about trees, you're not actually just talking about trees. You're talking about light and how the light vibrates and and the vibrational state of everything, and that's how um, trees interact with everything is um, through vibrational communication. So there's all sorts of things that are, that that trees will teach you about how they choose their color, um, how things fly in the air around them, how to avoid them at high speed. Birds have to do quite a few things um, to just sit in a tree. So w- when you when you when you when you basically some, somewhere it says where you, when you when you look at the size of um, a string, if it was the size of a tree, then a little spot would be, you know. Yeah, if, if you had if you had um, the whole entire all of the universes and everything packed into a sun, then um, the smallest part would be the size of a tree. And the sun is um, a good distance away, so it's just basically a tree is not just a tree in science, but it's also used as a standard of scale hmm. for natural things, and scale, a, a scale, the scale, they use a scale that can be different sizes. Since there's um, the problem with uh, string theory constantly changing in size, even when it gets to the size of a tree, and when you get into um, things like the things that I study that are not there, that are what happens to um, energy when it disappears, but it's still there. So all of a sudden you can't measure in 
quantum sizes. Does that make any sense? I think so. I mean, or did it's, I lose it's... you? <laughs> no, I mean, I I get a glimmer of it. I I was always fascinated by how trees and neurons look the same. Exactly. And so the last conversation we were talking about how I grew up, and by the time I was five years old, I already knew that I was a tree. So I've been a tree all of my life. It didn't just happen. And I've never sat down to actually talk about it with anybody. This is the first time. And I've never been on any type of blog or radio or I've never written a book or written down all of my thoughts, but as I was talking about how I grew up in such a scientific world and that I was at NIH playing with the monkeys and the monkeys played in trees also. But then I started actually looking at everything on the inside and when you you know most most science books they they show you a, a few veins they show you a few things that are inside of a hand but a hand one of our hands is really very very complex just one of our fingers um, the amount of um, lines that are running through everything um, all the way down to to our skin, um, it's all made the same way that trees branch out into leaves. Have you heard of the word fractal? Yes. Okay, so fractals are shapes that kind of appear random like a kaleidoscope. And if you go online, if anybody goes online, they can look up fractals and fractals are, there's just so much to, uh, some, somebody can spend their lives studying just fractals. If somebody wants to study another little tiny thing, which is origami, origami of paper is not a light subject. Um, scientists, and the the, uh, the the new telescope that was just launched needed um, an idea of how to open up. And that was uh, due to understanding how things open and close in the most simple way, the easiest, least energy-intensive demanding way, where things can just open up and close, which is not an easy subject to cause. Just to cause flowers, do it. Just to cause roses and other types of opening things in nature. Um, it's not just flowers, it's everything. It's, it's when we wake up, it's in our eyes. We have fractals. If you look in, if you point a light into our eyes, our eyes are opening and closing. And what you see with all of the different colors and strands, it's all fractals. And so the, the eye opens um, in that way. Does that make any sense? Yes. So there's a lot packed in that. Should I give okay. you a second? <laughs> no, it's 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 very interesting. So where do you? Um... Oh, okay. Let me let me finish. Yeah. Before you keep your thought, but let me finish with that. Let me get back on track. What you wanted to know is about why I was a tree. And I started to explain that as a little boy, all of the branching in, I, I, I was studying the, the, the inside of the brain and the brain was fleshy. And I looked at the brain as the ground. And 
all of the roots of the body go up into the brain and they grab on and they ex- they expand and they're grabbed on but that that doesn't mean that you know when you rip them out you can't leave part of it it's not like connected solid the brain is an interesting thing that you can do quite a bit of things to it but it's made specifically to stay in place kind of like the ground and so people can actually lose their heads and 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 when when you hang somebody since it's a normal united states custom to hang people in trees as they hang they drop and they 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 stretch and expand all of that stuff that it goes through the spine and goes through the neck everything running through the spine um those are all strands exactly like a tree so the tree has an outer skin but when i was a boy i would hang in trees upside down and in those times i was allowed to think about anything i wanted and so and it was science and when i was at nih there was that real live that and i got to spread them open and shine super bright lights through their wings and there wasn't anywhere that i could find that it wasn't all like strands so it was all a fantastic mesh of muscles and things that moved just like our fingers and just like our hands so bats are fantastic with with their little tiny with their little tiny claws they ha- they can hang upside down and looking at bats taught me that people are not right side up we're actually upside down as we stand on the ground and the earth goes around outward and we actually do better when we're upside down for our systems since the blood runs naturally to our brain and not away from it so hanging upside down is really good for the brain now we have lots of things working on our bodies like pressure and illusionary things like gravitation and gravitational pull um but it it's really about the blood that and how it you know I'm talking about the blood and how it you know it's it's easier for the heart to get it to the brain when you're upside down um and if if people did that they it, it, all through their life um the brain would never end up um having lots of the problems that it has because you need to sleep certain ways you need to lay certain ways you need to stand certain ways and um you need to be upside down so that the vein and the capillary um grow and grow strong and they feel that blood pressure which is very difficult to get if you're it, like most people are sitting all day and the people that are sitting all day are you, you know they 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 should they should just get it over with and take take up smoking so you know, for, for, for a, I've heard that. a few years ago smoke sitting was the new smoking it was a little right. sad but nobody ever pays attention so how but do you do you actually hang upside down regularly uh, yes uh, yes it's 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 brain food how do you how do you accomplish that 
an inversion table. Oh, okay. You know what an invert? You, you've heard of inversion tables. Yes, yes. You have one. Yeah, in, 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 inversion tables and inverting doesn't mean hanging upside down with your feet straight up all the time. If somebody's actually laying down and they have a way to have something flat because you don't want to do it with uh, pillows and all that kind of stuff because of your spine, but if you had some type of flat board that you could just incline um, five or six inches and you lay down with your head on the lower side, that is enough to relax. When you're laying down in your bed and your feet and your whole body are not up, just three inches at your butt, um, you're, you're not getting any rest. And I, I can't rest laying down, I mean, w- with my feet up higher than my head by five inches. So, so that's something that people have to do, but that's something that people would normally do when they're outside playing. And if they see trees, it, it's natural to hang upside down. Hmm. So I kind of hang on myself, so to say. I hang around, and I like my own company. So the the, the brain is the root. The brain is the ground with right. roots all through it. Imagine billions of neurons, billions of strands, billions of connections, billions. I, I'm talking... They can physically count billions, and because I see what's not there, I found close to a trillion. So, so, so that's the ground, and the 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 the, the cord that comes through the um through the back of uh the neck, through the the back of the cranium, and down into the spine. They run through the spine. The spine is open in the middle. And that's where most people don't actually recognize that a nervous system is not nervous. A nervous system is a highway. And we have two brains, not one, a right side and a left side. And most people, if you go, if you go to any university and you say, oh, hey, how many brains do you have? They'll, 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 oh, oh, I have one. No, people have two complete brains that can actually be separated. The hard wires can actually be separated, and they are perfectly fully functioning brains. So if somebody has one half of a brain go out with, with, with the ability of understanding how to mentally rewire um, two years, and you're good to go, two months if you know. So people really don't understand. You, 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 I was at NIH, and I've been through hospitals, and I've been through lots of different places. And I talk, and I hear people talking about neuroplasticity. And they say, yes, the, the, the brain is plastic. And I want to stop and say to them, but I just don't because I'm not going to ruin their day that no, the brain is not plastic. Neuroplasticity has nothing, the the plasticity has nothing to do with plastic. It's not like clay and moldable. It's not a physical thing. The neuroplasticity is something that happens not inside of the matter, inside of the part of the brain that's functioning. So it's kind of like saying that a magnet has magnetism on the inside of the magnet, when that's not true. It's like saying that a wire and electricity, we we have electricity running all through the United States. Everybody knows what electricity, nobody can hide from the idea of what electricity is, and everybody's seen a wire. And nobody actually understands um, the velocity of electricity through a copper wire. Nobody understands the velocity of electricity through a superconductor wire. Nobody understands um, the way that electricity travels, and the electricity doesn't travel through the wire. It travels around the outside. And what's interesting is that as it's traveling on the surface around the outside, it's also 
creating and it's creating magnetism because all electricity that goes through wire um, has a magnetism and the magnetism is the problem which is if you have something where the magnetism can go through the wire unimpeded like through a superconductor you don't end up with heat it's the magnetism that turns into heat not the electricity not the velocity of electricity since electricity probably not moving any faster than molasses and people don't understand that molasses like slow like one inch let's say 12 inches a minute can you understand that as fast as light travels electricity is supposed to travel at the speed of light but electricity is traveling at the speed of molasses it's kind of gooing through and people don't understand that because they don't understand um, the electromagnetic thing that's going around and when you study compressed air inside of um, a thing or the blood inside of our capillaries, how fast is our blood pumping? It's, uh, the, the heart pushes one little beat and it just pushes a little bit in, pushes a little bit more in. And out of, if, if you have a line that's like 100 feet long of, um, of hose in your backyard to, to spray water, it pushes in from, from one side and it comes out the other side. And it's really about the pressure and it builds up and, it, and you see it shoot out and, and everybody thinks it's going that fast, um, that fast. And it's only going as fast as it goes through the line, but it's going faster out of the nozzle. So people don't understand all of those changes. That's just too complex for most people, for most people. I use much more than just the 3% or 4% of my brain. Have you ever seen that movie Lucy? Yeah. Where, where, where the woman uses more of her brain? She would yes, have I've, to, I've you, know, you know, when somebody uses more of their brain, they can suddenly have the ability to move things with their mind. They can have the ability to do all sorts of crazy things because you're gaining access to everything around you. Your, your, your brain then, if you use more of your brain, you could actually talk telepathically. And the monkeys at NIH were doing exactly that, and that's what the scientists were studying right in front of them, is telepathy. And I was arguing when I was seven years old and I remember I was arguing with the head scientist of NIH, and he had his little converse with uh, little stripes because he also did a lot of LSD, and, you know, they used to study the LSD. That's how they created all of that stuff. But they took a monkey, and that's what my father was involved in, and I was watching it. And what they would do is they would have a live monkey, and they were testing how, when you have somebody that loses part of their brain, how they can remain, regain part of that, part of their function. So they, you know, scientists, you know, it was already known that, that, that there's two brains and the scientists would take a live monkey without any anesthesia and they would cut it open, cut open the, cut open the skull, the, 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 the cranium, and start removing things. And that's actually how I learned to do body work. Sorry, sorry for all the extra information, but it was fantastic. And so I'm looking down at the brain, and then, you know, they're, 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 they're cauterizing things as they go along, and they move. there's not that much blood um, running, running around. So they cauterize a few things, and once they cauterize everything, it's open, and the, 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 the monkey doesn't keep bleeding. He's just alive. He's just sitting there. He's looking at me. He's looking at them. He's, he's angry as hell. I'm paying attention to him. And I'm also paying attention, you know, he, you know, he, he hates, he wants to kill the scientists. And if he could grab a hold of me, it would be, it, I would be, a, it would be like a trophy thing. It would be like extra bonus points. But I'm looking down into this brain and I have to be careful with the monkey's hands at the time. So I'm right in there with the scientists and with my father. And my father 
had me just right there, and I could just get up. And he told me, just don't let that monkey grab you. Okay, fine. So I'm right in there, and I've got my face looking in. They had a little stool for me and everything so that I wouldn't touch anything. Very special monkey chairs, very special everything. Nothing could touch the monkey chair so that it wouldn't. there would be no ground contact of electricity, no, no grounding. It was all plastic. And they needed a um, check. They placed, um, you know, they placed elect- an electrode on one side, in, down, an electrode on the other side, in, down. They would connect them, and then they would send signals across the brain. And once they checked that they had one neuron on one side and one neuron on the other side, and that the connection was going straight through, after that started the fun part for them, but they didn't seem to be having fun. It was the fun part for me. Um, They would then take and start separating the two halves of the brain, and they would cut all of the hard wiring from the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain, physically cut through everything. With the monkey fully alive and nothing, the the monkey wasn't starting, the, the monkey didn't go haywire, the monkey's eyes didn't cross, The left eye still worked. The right eye still worked. The left part of the brain still controlled all of the right side of the body. The the, the right eye still controlled all of the left side of the body. But the brain was completely um, disconnected of all of the hard wiring between the two things. And there was the special place that my father made that would go down in between there to make sure that it was completely separated. And then they would put a piece of plastic down inside and the two pieces of metal that they put on the outsides of the plastic they would put little con- little con- little wires on them they, they had little wires attached and they would check that nothing was getting across nothing was jumping across physically and that monkey could still talk from one t- from one brain to the other and I had these Several times when I watched this, I had these eureka moments, and I'm like, telepathy. And 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 I was a little boy, but I mean, I I just yelled it out, telepathy. And they and and, and the head scientist took me and walked me away, and he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. If we cannot measure it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, well, that's that's the scientific view, right? And that's why I was fighting it. So monkeys could speak to themselves telepathically, not just between their brains, but in between them. And it hasn't been until recently that people have been studying how some people can connect to animals and they're trying to figure out if they can actually connect to animals as animals send their brain waves out. Well, I was, and the monkeys were talking to me in their cages when I was a little kid. I knew what they were saying and they weren't opening their mouths. They, they probably were, you weren't telling you to help them, right? <laughs> They were, they, 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 they were, no, no, they, they were, they were trying to lure me towards them um, so that they could rip me to pieces. Oh. And they, they, and they were, they were playing nice and everything. And I was communicating right back that I knew what they were up to and they would get pissed off and they would actually um, pee on me or throw, or, or throw excrement at me. So I got, I got, monkey excrement thrown at me lots of times through the, you know, or food or whatever they could grab a hold of and they'd get mad and then we'd become friends again. But they weren't afraid of me because I was a tree. Were they generally, did they feel like they were, did they know what was going on and they feel like they they knew exactly what was going on. They knew they knew better what was going on than you and I know. So they are smart. Smarter, not just smarter, hyper fast smart. That's kind of sad. 
I mean, the the stories you tell about these monkeys, it, I can't help but feel sorry for them. Oh. I need the monkeys, but the monkeys, um, in, in, as incredibly intelligent as they were, as incredibly um, capable of remembering everything in memory, um, that's where we get into my arguments with the people at NIH for what right did they have to kill God's animals. Um, but, the, but the animals um, didn't have a soul. So when they died, they didn't, you know, they, 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 they were all made like the trees. You've seen the forest fires in Australia and the forest fires around the United States. How many times have you cried? A lot. Or, or, or even teared up in, in, in the reality of what happens to one tree. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking like, you know, feeling bad about them, but actually recognizing that all of the trees have feelings. Well, I know. The they trees, they actually they communicate and tell the other trees that a fire is coming. Exactly. Exactly. Trees and plants. Oh, oh my God, they are crazy intelligent. They communicate with everything. And I can see them communicating with everything. I just, you know, I guess they just talk my language or I talk theirs. So, but you've but, never but, done but any. People, um, people don't know. Go ahead, go ahead. You've never done any drugs, right? right? That's a tricky question. I have never done any drugs outside of my brain. But all that my brain does is makes drugs, <laughs> and it takes three months from it takes three months for the drugs to be produced from the bottom of my spine until they go through um, the natural way. So I work on my natural drugs through my spine because as soon as you start putting in something from the outside, the only the only drug on the outside that I do because I'm addicted is coffee. But that's because huh. my grandmother when I was when I was when I was young, when I was over in Mexico, she used to give me coffee and it was with with with, with um with these uh with this bread that in the morning. My God, you know, co- hot you know, it it was mostly milk and then it was, you know, it wasn't any water, it was milk with uh coffee. I was ready to go. <laughs> it's 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 a so the as taste far is as addictive. The, the drug thing. Uh, you're asking if I'm a drug addict. Yes, I am. I love my natural drugs, and I do like um, the speed and velocity of going hyper hyper ballistic. So I'm I'm faster than any type of missile or computer out there. So, 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 you talk so about, my brain, my, my, hmm? well, I just wanted to ask you about this idea of making, so you've had psychedelic experiences without actually taking psychedelics. I've had psychedelic experiences, but I can't say that I've had psychedelic experiences like the people out there that are on screwed up things like ayahuasca and claiming that they're, um, that they're a tree or that they're an orange or that they're getting attacked or, what, you know, what the hell. But you have to understand, I grew up at the National Institutes of Health where everybody smoked. And my <laughs> yeah. father didn't smoke and my father didn't drink. And you don't so drink. So the only thing that I don't smoke or I don't drink, that's what, the only thing that saved me is that Why my father that? didn't smoke or didn't drink. That's like the only thing I can attribute, other than the fact that he was super intelligent and that, you know, I got that experience. So, you know, I could, I owe him a lot. Well, what, what's your issue with alcohol? I don't have any issues with alcohol. But you don't, 
you don't. I, I, I don't have any issues with people doing drugs or alcohol or whatever they need to do. It's just that they're screwing themselves up. Right. Well, that. Why it, it, do you say it, that? It's, it's like if if somebody wants to jump off a bridge. <laughs> if I'm five but, years old as a child, I'm not going to go with them because I'm too small to hold on. What does what does uh, drugs do to the brain? That people you're... give really stupid answers. Most people give really stupid answers like it cooks the brain or it fries the brain. It's not that. You don't actually mess up the brain with drugs. And this will come as a shock to you and it'll be fascinating. And just on this one subject, you'd want to go off on a, on a tangent and just remain on this for a long, long time. But we'll, we'll ha- we're we'll going to talk about energy, but we'll talk just a little bit about drugs and what happens to a person. A person starts making natural drugs at the very bottom of their spine. And in men, it's actually in the genitalia. Every pl- it starts off with all of the hormones in women and all of the testosterone. And so we ha- so, so what we eat is very important, but people don't actually understand food. They, they've gone around the, 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 the pyramids and the food pyramids and all that kind of stuff. They should have gone around eat the Egyptian pyramids instead and taking a vacation and left people alone, oxygen that we breathe, and nitrogen, which is plant food and tree food. So I like I like nitrogen. And it's about another type of really good tree food, which is CO2, and the world making plenty of that. So I never have to worry about running out of CO2 since I'm a tree. Um, But basically, all of those different things are the basic building blocks. And people really never take the time to understand, like, people people have figured out that people need vitamin C because of the ships long ago. And if people didn't have vitamin C, they'd get scurvy. Right. The limeys. I mean, that's why they call them the limeys. But... So people get the scurvy and they die from it. Yep. So you die from vitamin C deficiency. Yeah. And that's and that's how the world likes to go is on the um, idea of deficiency. So by the time somebody's having a heart attack, huh, that guy needs help. Resuscitate him. By the time somebody's falling over, huh, start CPR. By the time somebody has a huge-ass tumor, oh, my God, we found it in time. It's only six inches. Just in time for us to cut it out. Everything is always at the very last moment. Well, that's the way that they did it with vitamin C. They waited until some guys were out there, and and the stupid fools weren't taking any, any fruits and vegetables, and, you know, they didn't get their vitamin C, and then all of a sudden they were all messed up. Well, that's at, the, that's at the extreme. But when you have a vitamin C deficiency that's not um, able to be seen, that means that if you have, like, what is 100% vitamin C inside the body, vitamin C is, is, is a very weird thing because there's vitamin C inside of our body. There's vitamin C on, on our skin. There's vitamin D, which is a much larger and more important topic, except it's not as important as C, but you need D for C. But D works inside of the veins and in the blood. So there's this stuff called hemoglobin that is needed for the oxygen. And the hemoglobin is the red color. Um, and everybody focuses on blood platelets, which blood platelets don't do anything. They're just like, um, it's like if you go to a water park and you have one of those little, uh, 
the little things that everybody slides on, that, 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 that's, that's what the platelet is. So the, the, the platelets um, carry the hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin is carried outside of them and inside of them. So it's kind of like the river. So if you have a really nice, clean river and you have hemoglobin inside, then you get to carry – then – then those things become important. The platelets become important to carry the hemoglobin and get everything to slide through. So, that, so they're helping everything slide and glide. They're allowing for the blood pressure to happen. It, it, it's, it's a complicated thing. But vitamin C is inside of all of that stuff. Vitamin C is a huge thing. But most – you've heard about vitamin C, right? Everybody's heard about vitamin right. C. Vitamin C, vitamin C, vitamin C. How many millions of times have you heard vitamin C? Do you know what vitamin C is made of? Acid? No. Oh. Most people don't know what vitamin C is made of. So I'm talking to the public or whoever is going to hear me someday, which is going to surprise them. Most people don't know what vitamin C is made of. The important thing about vitamin C is oxygen. So the, so the building blocks of vitamin C, hydrogen peroxide inside the blood, and, all of, and the things that fight infection inside the blood, the, com- the complex things, that people need, if you have a 100% level inside the blood of what you could consider a one, if we could figure out what the 100% level, if people get 80%, they still end up with problems. Humans were waiting for somebody to go out there and boat. okay, you've got zero, zero vitamin C, oh, that's why you die. So it's not until you have zero that anybody worries. So people walk around never getting enough vitamin C and all of the other things that they need. And that's what we're talking about is the drugs on the spinal cord. So when people walk around with all of these different deficiencies and then they walk around with gastrointestinal problems and they're, they're eating the foods the wrong way, their systems awake in the night and asleep in the day and it's, it's fluctuating so people are having all sorts of things, plus then all the stress. And then they take alcohol and drugs at its And what that does is the, 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 the body immediately, the, those drugs go in fast. And most of the time people take those drugs in some type of way that gets it to the brain directly. So they're screwing up their noses. I knew this guy that used to do cocaine and his whole face caved in. And he used to build race cars. I used to own a body shop, and he used to build the best race cars around. And he was the most fantastic, um, you know, super funny car, street car, I mean, funny cars for, 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 for the uh, racetrack. And he built these cars, and his face caved in. And his father was one of the top um, open-heart surgery persons in the, in, in the country and in the world. So his father made lots of money, gave it to his son, and his son ended up um, dying from, from cocaine. But the cocaine goes into the body, into the brain really fast, and it stops the production in the spinal cord of things because it says, oh, I found a way to get there. So it's kind of like the United States, the pandemic hits, Everybody rushes out to get a bunch of stuff. The shelves are left empty. And you start these huge um, problems with um, the delivery and the trucking and the uh, ships that are sitting off of the coast not being able to get the product in. And that's what happens to the spinal cord. Does that make sense? The spinal cord starts having problems that it got way too much in the brain and it says, stop all of the production. Yeah, it's, it's the natural and then there, happiness and then it, drugs. It falls off a cliff once the person stops being high or being whatever on their drugs, whatever the brain runs out of whatever it's using. Since we have systems to clean the dopamine, the, the, the natural dopamine that we make has to be cleaned out of our brains every day. So our brains are very efficient. And they throw stuff in. And then they throw other drugs in to, 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 to um, attach and remove all of your live things multiple times a day. So people are really beating themselves up by going to sleep and waking up and be, going to sleep 
and waking up, and they don't know how to regulate or manage their uh, circadian rhythms. And circadian rhythms and all of the rhythms of life are a huge thing, and the best way to study them is to study the way trees breathe. Trees breathe. There's a time where the trees are taking stuff in, and then there's a time stuff out. So trees have a really nice heartbeat and rhythm. And people don't know that. So there is a heart of a tree. You can look up. Heart of a tree. It's that easy. People could people could study all that stuff, but who takes the time? Me. Oh, the wrong answer. <laughs> hmm. All right, well, why we not? can... Uh... You know, why, why wouldn't, you know, if I, if I could study it, why not? It's, it's free knowledge. Why, why not? I mean, that's the thing is that we just, we just take trees for granted. They're just there. You know, we don't think of them as, as sentient beings. Not even that. If you if you, if you just if people started to get to the very bottom bottom of the barrel, and to even just recognize that they're alive, that's good enough. In, in that respect, if people started at the at the very bottom, that would be much better than where they are right now, which is sitting on their asses, waiting for somebody to hand them the biscuit. And I'm not talking about working for it. There's a lot of people at work. I'm talking about all of the wealthy people that count all their money and can't save anybody themselves, make one more second in life, and they can never make enough time for anybody. I I, I can make time for anybody just like this. Wealthy people can't. They are busy, busy, busy. And the phone is always with a busy signal. <laughs> I mean, I, I find that uh, money is not a healthy thing to have possession of. Um, money that... is not the problem, though. That, 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 that's like saying that cocaine is the problem. Cocaine is not the problem. Money is not the problem. You, you, you know, I mean, it would be a problem if somebody came and dumped a truckload of cocaine in my living room. Then I'd have to pay because you can't get rid of stuff unless you, I mean, I guess I, I'd still have to buy like trash bags, so it would cost me that, and I could like throw it away for free. But I still have to pay it through the condo fees. Right, but what I'm saying so is it, that it, money... If you have problems and you add money to it, it's like it seems like the problems get worse. No, absolutely not. That's people with with that's the people with without self control. That that that's right. a very dangerous blanket statement because if somebody if I ended up with a lot of money, like with my inventions, which at some point I'm going to have to do that. You know, and it's not because I'm going to have to. It's once the world recognizes that they need energy and I'm the only guy around with the inventions. Figure that one out. And at that point, if I had a lot of money that I don't need, I could pile up in banks or I could make lots of cool stuff and give it away. Well, and you're... What would I make? I'd, ma- I'd, I'd make energy... Uh, you know, not only would I make all sorts of energy stuff that people would pay me for, I wouldn't be able to get rid of enough money. I might even, you know, make make a paper mache house to prove that money doesn't grow on me because I am a – come on, fill it in. Tree. Tree. <laughs> but you're a balanced – individual i mean i found that you know most people who are really 
intensely focused on getting money are unbalanced. Yeah, but they're they're intensely focused on getting money. They're not intensely focused on knowledge. Right. They're not inten- they're they're not intensely focused. They they don't put their energy towards doing something other than their than doing themselves harm with their self centeredness, self ishness, and self and. People that love money would hate to hear me talk because if they don't have a lot of it stored up, then they can't like snap their fingers and have some slave come and bring them something to their doorstep. When they got to get up off of their ass and hang upside down in a tree. Now, if everybody was hanging upside down in a tree, and then doing something the trees do really well. Do you know what trees do really well? No. What? Tai Chi. And do you know how they do Tai Chi? No. Like Bruce Lee. You've heard of Bruce Lee? Of course. Of course, everybody has. Do you know what Bruce, Bruce Lee, his favorite exercise was? Tai Chi. He was asked one time, "What, I, 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 if I'm correct, never want to be incorrect since everybody, but he was asked one time what his favorite exercise, if he, if he had to do one exercise to stay strong, from what I remember, if I'm correct, he said, like, but this is, I, I know this is the truth, so I don't have to ask anybody or Bruce Lee, I can tell you what it is. If you stand like a tree and just stand straight up, just standing is a really good exercise. You know, you know, you know like, when, like, like the Queen of England has those guards out there and they just stand? Mm-hmm. You know how much work that is? Really? It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of muscle to remove the movements of the body. So it takes a lot of, it, it's really good exercise. So when you actually do like Tai Chi and um, yoga and different things like that, the important thing is about um, the muscles. But it's kind of like, you know, you don't have to do the, you know, I'm not ta- saying you have to do that, but like ballet, ballet. Is all muscle—it's—it's—it's it, it, it's, it's tensioning muscles. So it's kind of like uh, keeping everything taut for for a while, and that's um actually so so. If everybody knew that they could do a lot of exercises without moving at all, then then exercise would actually not be seen as everybody going around and trying to give themselves a heart attack after sitting on their butts all week. You you, you have a lot of people who give themselves heart attacks by sitting all week, and then they go to the gym for one day, and then they run. Yeah. Those people deserve to die. So you don't think running is a good exercise? I think it's the best thing if you if, if you if you know how to run and you know I, I'm I'm going to be running in 2024. <laughs> I'm oh, that's to do right. 10K. <laughs> are, are you really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, we have so somebody calling in. We have somebody calling in to our show here. You want to you want to yeah, take the call? Let's see what they say here. Hello, caller. Who's this? Yeah, my name's Joe. I called in because um, I saw that you're, you you say in your um, on your page Socratic dialogues. So I presume you use a Socratic method in order to come up with uh, conclusions. Okay. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so um, 
What is it that uh, you conclude about life in general? Robert, do you want to take that? Life in general? Mm-hmm. Would you like a, a three or less word answer? Yeah, or, nice or, or, or that's would be good. I, I, I really don't have a short answer on that one since I think that life, if you want to boil it down, the most important thing in life is um, how people treat one another mm-hmm. and the value of people um, recognizing other people because we're all individual worlds. But when two worlds collide, um, and, and, and they collide in a fantastic way, then the interaction between people is fantastic. So if I was to boil it down, if you want to say that, I think that um, people communicating and recognizing the value, because most people really destroy their lives because they don't even know how to say how are you to somebody? And, it, and when they do, they want a simple, quick answer, and then nobody gets to communication, connection. So, yeah, that's the best way to um, explain it. Okay. The, the connection. If you connect with other people, then you're connected to everything. All right. Uh, what about politics in general? Politics is um, everything. We're, we're involved in politics right now. Everybody that has an opinion is involved in politics. And politics is um, what, 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 you know, what, what, when, when people at the, be, at the dawn of man, and then at the dawn of fire, when man first held fire and he held it up, that was the politics that started as to, you know, did he have fire in his hand for protection against the animal or to use against the others around him? So you suddenly have a tool like fire which is much more than just a tool since it's a tool for everything and from the sun and everything. But when you have a, when you, when you have a tool that man gets a hold of, then it matters what's inside of that man's mind. And then you have to have what's called politics. Everybody that's involved, anybody that's not even involved with him that sees him from far away and says, whoa, there's another person like me And I can't just walk up and say hi because what do they intend to do with that big stick with fire on it? Is it for me or can they help me go and kill that lion if we work together or that that animal that's attacking us? Or can we use it to, to go and see at night and hunt together and, um, be constructive. So, so there's a destructive part and a, destruct, uh, and, and, and a constructive part. Constructive and destructive. So politics is okay. um, people either working together um, or not working together, and that's politics. Politics has nothing to do with what's going out there in the world with politicians. It has politicians nothing to do with politicians. politicians. Hmm? It has nothing to do with the politicians? It has nothing to do with the politicians because the politicians are not, um, are not actually governing with politics. They are using politics as a platform of control. And the people, um, it's supposed to be government for the people, by the people, but the people's involvement is limited. So in the United States, you know, I'm here, and I'm talking about inside the United States, but the United States is, the, the, the politics doesn't work from a, any angle. So it, it, it's not because there's, it, it's not about, it, 
you have to separate the word politics for what it is, which is what I talk about, and the politics of what people do. And when you have huge groups of people and you have you, you no longer have real politics the way that politics was um, at, at, at the dawn of man with, with you know with just a few people where the politics were so much easier and more realistic as to how are we going to help each other to get through the night and to have um, a warm place to sleep and um, start building into a functioning group. And if um, that functioning group part of thing was still around, but that got destroyed long ago by people. But that's a that, that's a that's a darkness that you know I don't usually um, associate with what politics actually is. I talk about politics as what it is, not how it's been destroyed. Okay, seems to me like a thing between politics. Okay. Huh? No, but let me ask you, caller. Where where do you come from? I mean, wh- what is what is your view of life and politics? Well, life means to me um, is that when I take a look at life around me today, it should be that of communication and connection. But I see nothing but conflict in the world, and that, of course, is um, also related to politics, but not the politics that um, you guys are talking about. It's the politics as um, given to us by the politicians, which is a lot of propaganda, and a lot of they, those people from around the world in different countries, are stirring up the conflict and making it harder for people to live their particular lives. Life in general should be about what can I do to make myself happy without encroaching upon the rights of other people. I'm only going to live on this earth once, so what should I do? Um, Politics, when I mentioned it, I didn't want, um, I wasn't talking about, um, you know, the origin (laughs) way back in uh, the Neanderthal days and which were expanded upon by Greek philosophers. But uh, when when you were, he was talking about politicians, that got down to the answer that I wanted. So life, did I answer that okay with you? Yeah. I'm sure. Do do you mind if I ask you a question? Or, or sure. after you finish? Yeah, as long as it's not too personal. If you want to know about my philosophy, I'll give it to you. But personal uh, details, I'm, I'm, no. No, we're not going to ask you your, your address. I'm not going <laughs> to ask any personal details. We're having a okay. we're having a open dialogue conversation. Mm-hmm. What do you think? You're having an open dialogue conversation what do i think we're not going to ask you i did (laughs) okay well somebody asked me for my address uh, yesterday so but (laughs) don't worry about it we want uh, (laughs) well the only thing i can do about that is apologize for them even though i don't know them but (laughs) that's all right that's okay i understood why she did it the thing is, is that you're having an open discussion. What do I think about it? I think having an open discussion in which both parties or as many parties are involved in discussion should have what's called, quote, unquote, the open mind. However, life is also about people with their confirmation biases. It's very hard to get through to people who have a very strict idea of what something is. People don't like to be wrong. And that leaves a lot that um, uh, it gives people the reason or the justification or the rationale to go into conflict. You will get into more bar fights over something that <clears throat> means nothing to both parties <laughs> than having any, uh, a good sit-down discussion about something which does mean something. So that's just the way people are. So um, the open discussion, good. May I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. It's it's a it's a question that's not actually a question. So let me just kind of uh, go through it and 
it's basically the way that I deal with what you're talking about. Like if I was to walk into a bar, the, the chances are, the chances of me getting into a fight are like zero because I'm not mm-hmm. going in there to hit anyone. And the chances that I'm going to walk out there with a black eye are quite high because if somebody talks to me, I'm going to tell them the truth, and the truth hurts. So mm-hmm. if somebody asks me for the truth, that I, for my truth or how I see something, then I have to make a choice. And if somebody's, you know, if I talk to them a little bit and they're polite, I'll tell them the truth. And I'll explain to them that it might hurt. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sitting, this is the first time Michaela asked me to be on the podcast. I've never done this before. I, I don't go on. I'm 58 years old and I've never openly talked to people on any type of anything on the forums or on any phone calls. So that, that, that wasn't a, that's not a thing that I did. And so I agree. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not opposed to talking to people in a bar or on the phone like this. But I have a personal question for you, but it's not something that you are going to need to answer because um, out of politeness I'm explaining to you right now that I'll answer it for you afterwards. And you can answer okay. if you like, but that's your own personal right. thing. And the question is, do you believe in God? And the answer is My, because there's uh uh-huh. excuse me. No, I was going to give you the answer anyway, but I'll wait for you to answer and then I'll give you my answer anyhow. Exactly. That that's perfectly fine. So if if I go into a bar and I have uh-huh. to get to know where somebody's from or or where they stand, you know, I have to first um throw things on the table. There's no way around throwing things on the table because there's no way for me to get to know anybody without them getting to know me a little bit. And a rough and tough, tumbling type of conversation where people pull and push on each other on a very light subject that can go nowhere is always a good start. And so do you believe in God is then followed in you know what I tell people is you don't have to answer it because that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I believe in God or you believe in God or if I believe in nothing and you believe in nothing. But can we come mm-hmm. to some sort of recognition that if there was a God, that's that's mm-hmm. the important thing is if there was a God. Would God have cre- would God have created creation? And if He would have, because if we are here, then the answer has to be yes. If there was a God, so if uh-huh. there wasn't a God, we're still here. That doesn't matter. But if we were, we are here. There's already that. If there isn't a God, we're here. And if there is a God, we're here. So that's a non-issue. So, but if there was a God. And he did create this world. Would he have some sort of idea of why he created it? Maybe no. I would think that out of the choice to take all of the time to make all of the things that I see, if I was God and I took Uh that much time, it would be mine and I'd want to take care of it and I'd want somebody else to take care of it. So I treat people and I treat life and I treat if there is a God or if there isn't a God, I treat life as creation, as if though I was God and how would God do it? As Mm. if I was God. I didn't say I was God because a lot of people will take it the wrong way. As if I was thinking, if I I was God, how would Mm. God treat everything and everyone? And in my yeah. opinion, right. it, in my opinion, if there was a God, and if there is a God, he has a really good reason to stay away and to not come out, which is why we're here. If, 
um, to see if we can actually stop being animals. And it wasn't something that we were born with. It's something that we were trained in. Not everybody is animal. Not everybody is animalistic, and so we are all mammals. But the animalistic part, mm-hmm. I call it mm-hmm. the humanimal virus, short or or the two words together for the human animal virus. And it doesn't hit everybody. Like with, when you have this pandemic, it goes hitting different places. And it goes hitting different people in different ways, and there's mutations, and there's a lot of different mutations, and a lot of different ways people have picked up on hate, which is not a human instinctual thing. It's not a human nature thing. It's learned. But that's all I have to say about that. Okay. So you, right. have to say, you, you believe in uh, God? Call. I believe it's a possibility that there is a God. But when people really ask that question, they're really asking from their uh, cultural viewpoint. If a Muslim was to ask me that, he would be asking, do I believe in Allah? If um, somebody from the um, Far East were to ask me, maybe they would be asking me about Confucius. Here in the West, they're asking about, do you believe that there's a Christian God? Well, I believe in the possibility of a, a God or a set of gods. The Christian God? Oh, hell no. When you take a look at the definition of a Christian God, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-merciful, all-good God, I would have to ask the questions, you've got to be kidding me. And then I, then I would say, uh, in my discussion, don't give me this nonsense about free will. An all-powerful God, all-knowing God, knows what's happening in advance. If he or she loves us, and knows that we're going to commit the uh, so-called mortal sins, which he then has the right, so people believe, to send us to hell, then he doesn't love you. I cannot, if I were a God, cannot create um, somebody that supposedly is in my image and um, allow them to suffer, not eternally. I can allow them to suffer to grow up, in order to mature, but not to suffer eternally. If I know that you're going to commit some kind of sin that I say well, offends me so much that even though I love you, I'm going to condemn you to a place where you're going to suffer the, uh, the fate of 10,000 sons continually ripping your skin apart for eternity, that's not an, all, that's not an all-merciful, all-good God. <laughs> okay. uh, you know. I think we got the idea. <laughs> yeah. So, now, you know, now, now that we now uh, no. that we beat that that horse, uh-huh. we don't have to go over that one again. <laughs> but yeah, do you mind if I jump in and say something? Uh, I was going to say one more thing. Oh, go ahead. I do believe that yes, in the in the future we are going to create as literal a God as can be, because when we finally get to the holy grail of what AI is designed to be. That AI, if it becomes a sentient being, will become a god. It will master the resources and the information on this planet in order to um, create new energy sources for itself. It will become extremely powerful. It will be a million times faster, um, a million times smarter than the humans. It will see us as cockroaches. It will know that even though some will worship it, there will be those who will want to destroy it. And it's very quick. Logical conclusion will be these cockroaches are going to be a pain in my um, sentient ass. And I think in order for me to survive, let, 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 I let, will kill them. Let's not get off track. Is this, Terminator. Is, this AI going, is this AI going to happen within the next 10 years where it actually makes a difference in our lives and in the lives of our children? In the next 20 so years at the there, most. There's, there's lots ten of years. questions. But he said 10 okay. years. <laughs> no, he asked 10 years. I said it at the most 20 years. Could be 10 years. Okay. The, um, well, the, the process. It's going, it's, going to hap- yeah. it's going to happen. I get what you're saying. But l- let me just say, what if I am AI? And mm-hmm. what if AI still in... 20 years flies right by me 
inside of supercomputers. But right now, what if I already have achieved the energy solution and the things to make everybody, uh, you know, a world that would sustain 50 billion people if people work together? Because no matter what you have with an AI society 20 years, 100 years, 10 years from now, you're still going to need people to work together on the earth for the resources. So it still takes the politics and the people working together, which is more important than the solution. Having the solutions without having people that work together, what do you have? Because right now I have the solutions already. And I can't just go out there and put them into the world without dealing with the whole entire politics and business and the businesses that are going to be afraid of me putting them out of business. Yeah, caller, um, Robert here has some energy solutions that we were going to get to that actually later in the show. But oh, his, okay, that, I would be interested in that. If you're going to talk, yeah, he's an inventor and he has uh, ideas about how to create, you know, cheap, free energy that would kind of re- replace mm-hmm. what we're using today. So he might be the oh, AI that okay. you're talking about. <laughs> but a human version. Oh, really? Hello, yeah. Mr. AI. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but he's not artificial. He's... <laughs> and uh, and, 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 and okay. I, I can give it in real, I can, I can be spoken to in real time, and I can actually help make them with my own hands. I don't have to build a whole new manufacturing system. Everything's already pretty much ready to... I mean, in 10 years, everybody could have energy forever. Is that the energy that one can get from the environment, either from uh, the plasma or from the um, energy waves that are supposed to be there already? Uh, no, 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 no. It's it's um it, no. it, 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 it's from from heat, which is um, all over the place. I just want to uh, thank you for the call, man, and uh, we're going to sure. go back to our conversation, but I want to thank you for calling in and uh, giving us, you know, even though it was random, uh, the intention. So Before thank you. Joe goes, can I say one more thing to him? Yeah. Okay, Joe. Mm-hmm. You were t- we, we were on the God subject, and the God subject always comes up. So the reason I'm, I have to go there is because at the beginning of getting something started, everybody wants everything laid out. And we're going to be getting into the subjects of energy. And energy is about the whole entire system. And the whole entire system always comes back to the creation of it, how it was created, who created it, over and over and over and over again. And I have to start off by telling you and telling people I don't believe in God. Okay. Because God doesn't exist. And you have to listen closely because I'm a complex person. God doesn't exist Mm -hmm. because God does not exit. God's forever. I exist. I can die. I can exit. So I don't believe in God, and God does not exist. But God created me, and that's why I exist. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated thing. But I talk to God Mm -hmm. directly. God talks to me directly. And when people hear about that in the future, If we get into these conversations about God, they're doing absolutely nothing for energy. Does that make sense? All right, Joe. Uh, Thank you so much. We'll we'll, uh, hopefully be in touch soon, but I want to thank you for the call. Have a good night. Okay. Take care. Have a good night. Okay. So... Um, that was a nice call. Yeah, 
it was uh, interesting, um, and I, you gave some interesting insights there. Um, so I guess we can get into the energy thing. Um, we we have we'll probably go another thirty minutes or so. So why don't you just give us an idea of where your inventions are kind of heading, and if you were to like, for example, uh, if you have an idea for like a battery, or do, you, or is it something more like? Um, no, what is your, no, no, no. What What is your invention? Uh, uh, Let's put it like I can, that. I, what is I, your... can, I can, I can, I can make batteries better, but making batteries better doesn't solve the most basic, fundamental things of energy. And energy as a topic as a conversation could take years of podcasts getting into all of the different types of possibilities. But I simplify everything. I'm an inventor. I get down into the basics of everything, the basics of generating electricity, the basics of taking energy and changing it into the different forms Electricity is just one of those forms. But one, but one of my inventions, I wanted to tackle something for all of the different types of ways of generating electricity. And when, when, you, when you stop and ask people, what is the best way to generate electricity? They say nuclear fusion, nuclear fission. They say Solar, power, solar, they say wind. Wind and solar don't generate anything as far as electricity. Nuclear infusion do not generate electricity. What generates electricity? It's a question. Uh, what generates electricity? Well, I think from, uh-huh. from what I've heard from you is that it's heat. No, it's called an electric generator. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's an it's an it's an electric generator. So, if you have a a if you have a power plant that's using coal, coal is used to steam water. Steam water is used to build pressure. Pressure runs through a turbine. The turbine then turns an electric generator. So the electric generator is actually generating the electricity. Without the electric generator, you don't generate electricity. Does that make sense? Yes. It's really easy. Solar panels do not generate electricity through a electric generator. Those photovoltaics change the um, change change the uh, light that hits through it the, 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 through photocells, and they are like um, backwards diodes. So it's like the electricity goes directly and jumps right into the wire as little capacitors. Does that make any sense? That's the only um, form of generating that doesn't use an electric generator. Everything else out there generates electricity. Batteries do not generate electricity. Um, okay. Batteries only store, but if you have a fusion reactor and you're heating up water, you have to have a generator. If you have any type of any type of factory generating electricity, you need a generator. So for many years, I was working on all of the different forms from, from, from wind, from waves, um, d- different types of uh, different types of energies that um, haven't been recognized out there as far as um, going through um, the things that would push on the turbines to turn the generators. And then I was working on new turbines, 
getting closer. And then I was working on transmissions for transferring um, the forces without the transmissions breaking. And then I designed new electric generators um, that are um, four to 10 times as powerful as a current electric generator. So when you have a um, nuclear power plant that's out there already, or like the two that they're building over in Ohio, I believe it's Ohio that they're building two new ones in, um, or all, all the ones that are existing across the United States, or, or the, or, or the uh, hydro power plants that need generators, any of the electric generating plants out there, if you could just take a, a ge- their generators out without rebuilding the whole plant and you just put another generator in, and if you could just double the output, what would that do to the world? Did I go too fast for you? That, no, that would be great. That would, that would yeah, revolutionize well, things. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not a two. I'm a three to ten. When it comes to hydropower, it's actually um, due to a lot of other things that interact with each other. I'm at thirty to sixty times because hydropower is not being done correctly. Wow. So, what what would that do for California for the Colorado River? If people didn't have to use that water um, for generating electricity, if they if they use one one fiftieth or one twentieth of the water for generating their electricity, then they could actually have three or four times the electricity and still only use twenty you know twenty times you know one twentieth of the uh, water, and then they'd have. 20 times, you know, 20 times the water and for other things. The storage. Right. The, the, the hydropower plants are, are not being run. You know, they're, you know, they, they're, they're done. They're fantastic. You know, don't beat up effort. But how can an inventor not harp on something that wasn't finished. That's that's right. So so that's um that's amazing. So you're what does it take for you to why haven't you been able to get this into the world or what is stopping it? What is the what are the the generator, there. the generator, the generator. I just, um, I, 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 I got, I, I was in the process of um, finishing the generator about three years ago, but for the for for a year after that, um, till about two years ago, I was still um, making sure that I went all the way down the road. Because once I opened up the door to those new possibilities, if I didn't finish and there was a way. But at one point, um, I I have regular generators that are like what you have out there in the world, which are just, you know, the, the, they're basically brushless motors that are good for generating electricity. Um, small ones, and I have my new systems which don't use. Um, it's all it's all handmade, and um, you know, but it's still it, they're, they're still um, the same in size, but they're just much more or effective is a better word to to use, and then they're more efficient also and lighter weight, but. I I I I had reached the end where I thought I was finished um, with the generator about three years ago, and um, little by little I kept toying with it because for that year I was um, I, I was developing um, a motor because motors and generators in the world like if you have a um, a Tesla car with a motor in it. 
um, or if you have any other other you know if you have a bicycle with a generate with 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 a, a motorized bicycle electric electric bicycle the motors um when 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 they're slowing down they generate electricity so a motor is a generator and a generator is a motor but i designed a motor that was not a generator and but my generator um, does go both ways and, and is a motor generator. But since they're both the same, I was um, working on the motor, and while I was working on the motor, I came across something that was different, and I applied it to the generator. And um, after I had already gotten my gener generator to be about five times uh, as generating about five times as much as the, the regular, normal, modern motors, um, it, it, it suddenly, the output of wattage suddenly doubled, you know, in, in, one, in one step. And um, that was a nice surprise. And then about six months ago, I saw a way to uh, make it a totally different way so I've got options. And if I hadn't found those options, once you get into the scaling up of things, it's really important for different sizes and shapes and where you're going to place something to have those types of options. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah of course, yes. Hope I don't go too fast. No, no. And And so what is it that Stops me. I've been in. When when I met you that day was the first time I had gotten out of my house in eight years. Really. Uh huh. Out of my shop. Holy shit. Eight years without talking to people while I was inventing. I, I'm just, you know, the world needs energy and I wasn't going to stop until I looked through everything. I did I really didn't I, I wanted to get all my ducks in a row so to say. I was taught that a long time ago. You don't you don't jump the gun. Or I would have started in in nineteen ninety nine. But then I right. wouldn't have had all of these inventions. Well that's great. I would have had fantastic I had fantastic stuff already but I had to ask myself a long time ago, do you want to be, you know, have a big business for 30 years and make, you know, all the money in the world, which I already could have? Or, or do I want to be the one with the invention? Right. Okay, well. There's a cost. <laughs> yes. There's a do cost. you feel that, do you feel happy with your decision? I don't know how ecstatic, how, how many different ways, um, I, you know, I could explain the words that it would take to define my, <laughs> uh, I'm an inventor, how you, you know, fantastic is not good enough. Okay, Ben. When I was I, when I was younger, was a word califragilistic expialidocious, and that's just not good enough. But have you met any other inventors that are going down a similar path of of of, of understanding about no. this thing? No, no. Um, the only person that I've heard that was. Colorful, um, able to turn on their um, inner child, um, turn to their inner child, or talk with their inner child. Um, the problem is that most, 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 there, there's a lot of people that are, are in contact with their inner child, but most of those are autistic. And I'm lucky that I'm able to be artistic 
and autistic, and I'm able to be fully mentally aware, but you have to have um, you have to have neuroplasticity and the knowledge of um, turning um, um, your brain or a brain, which is actually two brains, with um, with, with a body with, with a body which is actually a third brain, um, cause the, the, the brain goes in through your body and you actually can store energy inside the body. But I store energy, I, I store all of my information um, outside. So I've got matrices of, of places where I can store stuff. So I can um, go into different um, parts of my mind and I'm as crazy as... I'm as crazy as you want crazy to be. And I'm a say, I'm, I'm, I'm so saying that it's not funny and the truth hurts so I can go through both back and forth. Does that make sense? So yeah. there, there, there's, a, there, there's a book called Catch-22, and it, it, it entails um, about these pilots in, in, in Britain a long time ago, and they 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 needed to go off to war, but if they went off to war, um, they'd get blown out of the sky. So they didn't want to go on the, on the, on their flight. So they get scheduled in, and the only way to get out of it is that they had to um, show that they were crazy. And as soon as you started showing that you were crazy, they say, "Okay, you're ready to go on the flight. You're that crazy." All of a sudden, they had to act sane, and then all of a sudden. They'd be told, nope, you're perfectly sane, you're perfectly fine, you've got a clean bill of health, go. They couldn't get out of it. That's a catch-22. Damned if you do and damned if you don't. Well, I have the thing where I can be um, super deliciously fantastical feeling silly. And dead drop honest at the same time. And there isn't a subject in the world that you could run through that I haven't run across at least a hundred times in my life lifetime. At the bottom of the sea, at the lowest point, what type of animals are growing, how much there is in you know, what the what the temperatures are doing, what's coming out, how much CO two is actually being produced by people. Humanity, how much actually is being produced um, by the uh, by by the natural world, which is so much more than CO two made by humans, is 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 inconsequential, and that's a that that that, that really rubs people wrong. But I don't care. I have nothing to lose. The the, the world's already um, hurting itself, and so you. you, you just like people don't know how drugs damage themselves and how scientists can't actually sit down and explain what happens when you stop um, the production, the manufacturing of your, your own, your very own natural chemicals of your very own awakeness. And once you stop that, you never get to being what you, were, what you could be if you were on natural highs and um, like like what the, the runners say when when people go running and afterwards they they're no longer running and their bodies are conti- are still pumped up and running and the, the extra blood and the um, extra oxygen puts them into a euphoric moment or when people climb the mountain Kilimanjaro over in Africa. And they re- reach the summit, and all of a sudden, you know, due to the uh, low oxygen, and their brains kicked in their own natural oxygen, and they get a super high, and then suddenly the body starts producing what's called nitric oxide, and your, your body starts using oxygen at a super fantastic rate. You, you, your body starts splitting um, the water into hydrogen and oxygen, and you and and you can suddenly you suddenly look out and you, you can see everybody talks about seeing God and being in a spiritual place 
And it's just um, being awake. Well, I'm awake. <laughs> I'm awake all the time. I, I know how oxygen works, and I can get, I can get a hundred times, I can get a thousand times more oxygen to my brain than anybody else around me. But through through breathing. Through breathing, um, and through drinking water correctly, which people don't know how to do, um, knowing okay. how not to drink. How do you drink too much water? Correctly? water. Um, when, when you're a baby, when you're a baby, how do you grow so fast? You're growing exponentially, and you're only um, getting your nutrients. You know, some, pe- some, some, some children get their milk from their mother, which is natural and that's real food, but other children are given powdered milk with water. How much how much value is there in powdered milk with water? Nothing. Okay, so they're basically feeding on water, and they're growing exponentially. Why are they growing so quickly? Because of their ability um, to um, use the oxygen from the water. If you can actually break the oxygen from the hydrogen, if you can do that um, inside the body, you've got one thing going for you. But you have to... Um, get the water into your body. So what, what children do is um, they suck on a nipple. And bottles are made specifically with very small holes in their, in, in their nipple. And the bottles that have pe- some people take and they want to hurry up and get their children fed really quickly so they make the hole larger. And when you have a larger hole, it creates less of a vacuum inside of the mouth and doesn't pull the enzymes out of the inner lining of the cheeks. So all of the enzymes that are made for the body, for your stomach, to, to basically break up the food. And when you break up the food, it's actually for also breaking up everything into, um, the smaller you go, the easier you can get to um, to everything that you need so that everything chemically reacts and for the body to use water. So basically, when you drink in, from a glass, you create very little um, suction. And I learned this um, at the National Institutes of Health where people were getting operations on their brains and operations, you know, there was people with tumors and you know, cancer all over the place and heart problems and every type of thing. So there was people, and, and I used to go sit, you know, whenever, you know, I was uh, bored, I'd go and talk to all of the people in the hospital part. And um, the first thing you get told after an operation is don't drink through a straw because you'll pull the blood out. If you have any operations like in your teeth, like if you go to the dentist, don't drink through a straw because you'll pull the blood out. And so, like, if, you know, like me, I drink all of my water through a small, tiny straw. And as I suck it in, I pull out enzymes from my inner lining of my lips, of, of, my, uh, of the inside of my, um, of my mouth tissue. And our, 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 our mouth is one-way valves where... Water molecules can go inward, but water molecules cannot go outward. It's just like reverse. It's just like how they came up with reverse osmosis from from, from the way that our, um, our our own system filters water. And water goes in, and the enzyme molecules are secreted because those are actually secretions. And when water goes into them, then something turns on and squeezes out to to the point where, like, when sometimes um, people are eating and they have a lot of saliva and the saliva squirts out across the room. It's just like watching um, a, like, like a snake throw out venom. The saliva can actually excrete through the, through the, through the little, um, from the pushing. Um, very, 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 um, you know, with a lot of pressure. So it's, it's about drinking water 
and not put, not drinking water very quickly to put in your stomach because then that changes the alkalinity. Um, water also doesn't go through the stomach lining, and then people end up with a lot of water weight. And if people found that out, then all of a sudden all the doctors that do um, diet, all the diet stuff, how much money would they lose? So you drink water through a very small straw. Would... Uh, I usually buy the ones that are for coffee, the th- really thin ones. I see. And you're saying that if you don't drink water through these through a straw like that, you're just not drinking it correctly and you're not getting the benefit of it. Well, you can drink it through I, – I, I, I drink it sometimes when I need a lot of extra – when I want to relax and I don't want to wake up, I use, I use a regular straw. And then I just take a sip every five minutes and I make sure I move it around my mouth so that it touches everything because I need the oxygen. If I just throw the uh, water in, um, I'm creating a bomb. Water um, isn't good for you in your stomach if you drink too much of it. Um, You've heard about boxers. Or runners, haven't you? If, if you if you drink too much water before a run, what happens? I mean, it's not if good. You, if you, if, correct. If you drink too much water before a boxing match, you'll lose. Right. But what what water is heavy, very heavy, and the stomach is a very very very. Um, it's a machine. Is like a battery, and it has battery acid in it it has all sorts of stomach acid and the body regulates the acids and the acids are also controlled by the enzymes so if the body does not receive receive enzymes it does not throw the um, acids in does that make any sense? Yes. So, so it's a complicated thing where um, for, most, um, for, for most animals, like let's take a monkey. A monkey will go and it will eat, um, let's say, a banana or let's say uh, an apple or an orange. Um, and what it does is as it um, chews, it's pushing the vitamins into the uh, mouth lining. And vitamins do not work inside of the stomach. They, they work in the mouth lining and they go... They they, they they work because they're, they're, they're transformed into enzymes. Now, there's some um, vitamins and minerals, minerals and vitamins that work in the stomach because minerals don't work in the mouth enzymes. Um, but there are minerals that are all over the place, and, and they're in the stomach, and there's minerals and everything that have to go, and they have to be processed um, through the liver and kidneys, so the kidneys clean, the liver is trans, transforming and, 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 and changing everything, and you're going through, um, the body is throwing out things like ammonia through the urea cycle when you, um, when you urinate. But most people try to get, you know, the body tries to get rid of the ammonia and, you know, most people work on um, that. They don't actually recognize that the ammonia um, doesn't have to go through um, a person's urinary uh, uh, when they urinate. So many people that drink water correctly, that eat correctly, that exercise correctly, that do everything correctly, um, the body recycles the ammonia and turns it back into um, other things, into, into the things that then create again the ammonia and the ammonia will kill you but it's inside of us there's all sorts of things inside of us that are that 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 too much of will kill you so it's like when you exercise and you create lactic acid you know all of the different acids and all the things that 
that hurt people's muscles and that build up and you've got all sorts of stuff going on. But it all comes down to some basic things of knowing how to chew your food, when to chew, how to chew, and how to drink a little bit of water. And that doesn't mean I'm healthy. That means that I know how to abuse the system to get the things that I do need now. You know, I, I, I work a lot. I sit around. And um, then there's a lot of things that I do so that I don't um, waste away completely. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. So this is interesting. So we're going to have to – I didn't know you you also knew so much about nutrition. About what? Nutrition? Oh, yeah, I know everything about nutrition. So are you saying then that, like, over-the-counter, the vitamins that people are taking are useless? No, they're not useless. They they are damaging in the way that people take them. If, really? If you, know how to take, if you know how to take vitamins, then you're in great shape because if you know where vitamins go and what it is that they're trying to do, um, then you're doing great. But if you take a multivitamin, you throw it into your stomach, um, wait for the explosion. And, and the explosion isn't something that happens in the stomach all the time. It attacks people in different ways. Some people get insomnia. Some people, because there's, cer- there's certain things that trigger. Everything is, the, the body works off of triggers. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's really good. And that's part of the conversation of why I'm a tree. Trees do a really good job of putting everything that they need in their place in a very good, um, in in a very well-timed system. And they don't complain. Humans complain. We complain about everything. But the body is like a building. So you have a, a, a big 50-story building with lots of people living inside of it. And you, you you have the heat going down. You have all this stuff going on. But at night, that whole entire building um, has to sleep. You can't have somebody with loud music disturbing all of the other neighbors. So everybody, everybody turns off the lights at night, and then you, ha- then you go through a nighttime. And the nighttime is when the body gets rid of everything. And so you have a system um, which is called an endocrine system. Do you know anything about the body? Um, Like those types of systems, you have a lymphatic system. Yes. And you have... the, 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 lymph, the lymphatic system is um, basically uh, it, it, it's your it's your it's the thing that takes out the trash. It's the thing that makes white blood cells while you sleep, or while it's where it's work, it works all day on making white blood cells. But it's basically in kind of like a sleep mode because inside of your bones is different than outside. Not not everything is running around, so it's kind of like um, a little hibernation pod. In, you know your, the the bones of your body. On the inside, um, it's it's like a tree. There's parts of a tree um, trunk that are dormant, but there's lots of little teeny things happening there happening in there that most people don't pay attention to. And inside of our bones is where you, that that's where you're making um, you know your red blood cells, and you know there's white blood cells being made all of you know. You've got a lot of stuff going on inside of an endocrine system. The endoc- you know, you, you've got different glands um, producing your white blood. Everything that's basically for tacking, like viruses, your, your immune system, and cleaning up. So when people are sick, they need their sleep because that's the only time you're going to heal yourself, fix yourself, rebuild muscles, and all of the things that happen during sleep time. And during that time, what you do not want 
is an excess amount of oxygen, excess amount of oxygen. You want your oxygen. You don't want to go oxygen negative, but you don't want to have way too much oxygen. So breathing and everything is fine, but during the night, you don't drink water, do you? And so you don't do things that introduce that stuff, like take vitamin C right before you go to sleep. Vitamin C is the thing that you take in the morning when you wake up. You should. And n- not on an empty stomach. So you have to have a little bit of water in there because you're throwing extra acid in there for what vitamin C does, which is absorbs, but it breaks things up. It, it's doing a lot of things. But vitamin C, it's, it, its main function is oxygen, and it works inside the blood you know, most people think that vitamin C works inside the stomach. No, it works in the blood, and the blood is what's going around the stomach and around the lungs, and the vitamin C is providing oxygen. So that's your wake-up thing. It, it wakes you up. It turns your system on for the daytime functions. And then at night, when you go to sleep, your nighttime systems wake up. Just because you're asleep doesn't mean that any part of your body, very little goes to sleep when you sleep at night. It's just different functions. So you have all the trash trucks and everything turned on. You've got the factories to throw out the trash, and everything's going around and it's collecting trash. So right before you go to sleep, if you take vitamin B, a vitamin B complex, and knock out all the vitamin Bs, get your vitamin B12. Without those, um, you don't produce um, the hemoglobin and all the things that you need for the next day. And then the next day, you need the oxygen. You know when to put the oxygen in. All of a sudden, you're a little crazy. <laughs> like me, I, 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 could, I could go on like this for 24, or four, 24 to 48 hours and not slow down. All right. Well, when we, we're going to wrap it up here, but yeah, before you <laughs> that, that that was enough. <laughs> no, but uh, we what we'll, we'll do is next week we'll get more into this about the, you know how, how to run the body efficiently, and then we'll get more into the energy ideas that you were exploring. Well, they're, both, they're all the they're they're all the same. The way that the body works. It's the way that the world works, the way that bo- the body, the body is a nuclear fission and fusion power plant. People just don't know it. And um, so all of our, all of our, mo- all of our atoms and molecules have atomic um, things going on at the atomic level. That's an atom size. Um, we, we have all that stuff going on. So, Studying the body, studying energy, studying how we need to be alive in life and live in some sort of... If we can understand the harmony of what's happening in our body, then we start, suddenly we get connected to the world and the functions of the world and the sun. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's it's very elegant, connected. too. It's all connected. Right, like so the, the the body holds the key to to our energy future. The a tree holds a much better. We're 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 a tree is so much easier because a tree is so much simpler. Once you get once people get past the idea of figuring out how a tree puts energy in and out of the ground because all of the sunlight that's coming down to the tree, the tree is just being used to ground it. So the earth is actually using the trees the way that we use hair on our heads. Right. And when you rub a balloon on your head, you can generate static electricity from, 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 Rubbing a balloon, well, that's happening um, outside as the wind blows through the trees. You're generating 
um, electricity. And it collects this static electricity and runs down through the trees. And sometimes it gets cloudy and rains and um, the, um, the, the static electricity collects and then that becomes lightning. But it's there all the time. It's called dry lightning. You don't see it when everything is dry. And sometimes you, you see the lightning just collecting because there's extra amounts of charges and then suddenly you, you have dry lightning um, storms without any water. But whenever you have pressure and water and the clouds collect, then suddenly you get you get all of this interaction that forces um, all of the electricity to start collecting and creates lightning. It's just static electricity. There's not much energy in it, even though there's millions of volts. Hmm. But there's okay. very little energy in it. Right. And it keeps going on and on, but that's the body. So it's all, it's, it's all the same conversation, energy. Conversation with the tree continues next week. Robert, thank you. There you go. Signing off. Have a good one. Next week. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody, for listening.